I want to get back to Hebrews chapter 2 in our study here. Hebrews chapter 2. If you haven't noticed, the study in Hebrews is fairly technical. And so we, we just kind of take it a little step at a time here because it involves a lot of things. We bring a lot of things together. This letter, written anonymously, um, I think my own personal opinion is by the Apostle Paul, written anonymously to Jews of his day who were struggling, struggling terrible. Now, these were not just any Jews. In particular, these were Jews who actually believed that Jesus was who he said he was, the Messiah. And they came to him through the testimony of many other people. Some of these Jews might have even heard Jesus speak. But if they didn't, certainly they heard those eyewitnesses who did. Those apostles who did hear Jesus recorded it down and spoke the same thing. These Jews heard. But they have a similar type of problem to all of us. When I say us, I'm talking about non-Jews. I'm talking about us Gentiles, we're called. Now, a non-Jew is anyone who hasn't been part of the, not just the Jewish race, but the Jewish customs the Jewish religion as well. And so he's writing to these Jews, and we've got to keep that in mind because they have kind of a particular problem that even those similarities to ours today is a little bit different in his day. And that particular problem was this, that when Jesus showed up on the scene and announced that he was the Messiah, it would be very sim similar to some construction worker from Key West showing up here on Sunday morning and saying he was Jesus, okay? It would be very similar. I mean, we look at him and say, you can't possibly be who you, who you say you are. Well, the Jews had that problem with Jesus. And that's because as their promised Messiah, the Jews had in mind that he was going to break the Roman rule, that he was going to set Israel up as a world-ruling power, and that he himself was going to set his throne up in Jerusalem and run the world. That's what they had in mind. That's what they were all anticipating. That's what they were all looking for. The Old Testament prophecies notwithstanding, they interpreted it in their way that would be natural, similar to what we do, the same kind of thinking. And so when Jesus showed up, despite his miracles, despite all the, all the signs and wonders he gave, Israel as a nation rejected their own Messiah. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. And I'm just touching on it to give you kind of the flavor of, of what the book of Hebrews is about. But they rejected him because he did not meet their expectations of what a Messiah ought to be. Now, let's get honest about this for a minute, all right? How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have been disappointed by God? Hmm? You prayed for something and he didn't come through. I prayed that I would win the lotto. And I even used Bible verses as my numbers. And God let me down. Hmm? He didn't meet my expectation. He didn't 
do what I thought he should do. Likewise, I've had less sanctified prayers, you know, like, Lord, bring down fire from heaven and just consume them to the people I don't like. Okay. He doesn't meet that expectation either. They seem to prosper. God has disappointed us all. And this is what he's, this is kind of the background, if you will, for this letter to the Hebrews, who even though they believed Jesus was the Messiah, and they had experienced that initial salvation, if you will, being converted into Jesus as the Messiah, even though they had had that personal experience themselves, in time, that experience began to wear off a little bit, and they got to looking around, especially in those days. You think the world's falling apart now? You should be living under the Roman Emperor Nero when the world really fell apart back then. And they, they got disappointed. As far as they were concerned, God was letting them down. Okay? And so some... Someone got the idea that the reason God was letting them down, it's kind of the same thing we get to, okay? The reason God didn't answer their prayer, the reason he let them down, the reason he didn't meet their expectations was their fault, in essence. They weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. Now, keep in mind, I'm trying to give you a little in, insight into the Jewish mentality of these Hebrews here. They had been raised to please God by going to the temple and offering sacrifices. They had been raised to please God if they couldn't get to the temple. Every Saturday, they went to the synagogue and listened to the law that was being explained to them on how and what they had to do to please God. They were steeped in this. And it was a very tangible kind of religion. Okay, they could actually see things. I mean, when you offer an animal as a sacrifice and you have that priest up there all dressed up, it's very concrete and tangible. And so what they naturally went back to was this idea. Well, the reason God has let us down, the reason he's not doing what we want him to do, is because we ain't doing it right. We need to start over. Now, that's a very similar problem with us Gentiles as well concerning Christianity. There are people who experience tremendous joy and relief and for the first time in their life, truly a sense of personal worth, and security, importance, significance, when they first trust on Jesus. It's kind of a miraculous operation of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who comes into them as they believe, and they're all excited. But after a while, living in this world, that excitement kind of wears off a little bit. That joy of their salvation kind of kind of peters out a little bit. So they're asking, what happened to my joy? And they get the same idea that these Hebrews got. Well, I'm not doing it right, that's why. And so they find a list of rules and regulations they need to follow to be a, quote, good Christian. Now, you don't have to look very far to find that. As a matter of fact, you don't have to look at all because there's plenty of, quote, good Christians out there to tell you what a good Christian ought to be. And they give you a whole list of things that a good Christian should do. And a whole other list of things that a good Christian should never do. And naturally, we get the idea that our joy and our satisfaction is based entirely upon what we do or don't do. 
we get the idea that, well, the reason I'm miserable is because I ain't doing what God wants me to do. And we fall into the same exact trap that the Hebrews did. As a matter of fact, Christianity worldwide, and particularly American Christianity, has fallen into that trap that Hebrews fell into. Just as it was predicted by both Jesus and Paul in their writings and their sayings, we've, we've gone the same course of thinking that our salvation, and particularly the joy and the comfort of our salvation, is dependent upon what we do or don't do, that we are responsible for that. And so it sounds like heresy to most people when I say it is not what you do or do not do that God cares about. Doesn't that sound almost like heresy? God doesn't care what you do or don't don't do. That's not what God's concerned about. But let's be honest about it. If you do anything good, it came through him. <laughs> okay. Well, what's God concerned about then? The very thing our author of Hebrews is going to emphasize all the way through. In fact, later in the study, he's going to devote a whole chapter to it. The one thing God is concerned about is what you believe. Whether you trust what he says is true about you or not. That's what he's concerned with. He's not at all concerned about what you do or don't do. He's concerned about what you believe concerning the message he's been speaking to you through his son. You see, Hebrews started out that way, didn't it? God speaks to, has spoken to our forefathers in various ways, through angels and all types of things, but and prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. How does God speak to us through his son today? He speaks to us through the spirit of his son in our own hearts, in our own minds. And what he's concerned with more than anything else is whether you trust that or not, whether you believe that. And you listen and follow what he's telling you. Now, the Hebrew Christians, were they were quick to go back to the temple. They were quick to go back to the synagogue. They were quick to return to their old religious ideas that Jesus had called them to repent of. Remember his message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means a 180 degree change in your thinking. Quit believing that you've got to do something to get God to love you. God loves you, period, right now, just like you are. Repent, believe, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So our writer of Hebrews is talking about all this in a general term he uses in chapter 2. He calls it so great salvation. So he's talking about how God is saving us through his son Jesus. It's, this is the great salvation we've been studying about. How does he save us through his son Jesus? Before we get there, last week we kind of took a little aside, all right? It's really not an aside. It's according to the way it was written in chapter 2. But I wanted to emphasize the fact of how we need to be saved, how the whole world needs it. You see, the original creation account of God creating the world and humanity was that he created the heavens and the earth, and he put Adam and Eve, whom he created, in charge of. That's why you all have this little compulsion inside, whether you recognize it or not. You are all naturally control freaks. You want to control things. You want to make things happen. In your own little world, you're trying to arrange it. 
so that it happens. Now, I know the benefit of that is if you can control it, then maybe you won't have to be so worried. But that's God-given. Did you know that? Yeah, it is. You were created as a human being to rule the world. That's what God told Adam and Eve. Now, of course, the story continues how they blew it in the garden. When they sinned against God, they lost their ability to rule the world. In fact, rather than, than them having dominion over the world, the world took dominion over them. And it's been that way ever since throughout human history. Mankind has never been able to control the world, not since Adam lost it in the garden. But did that surprise God? Of course not. That didn't surprise him at all. Because he knew how he was going to cause Adam and Eve to rule the world, and it was totally different than what they expected and what we expect. So the writer of Hebrews gives it to us in these words, and I'm, I'm just going to read the words to you, and then we'll try to try to take them apart and understand what he's talking about. Beginning in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, he says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou made him a little lower than the angels, Thou crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. That's a pretty heavy statement there. What's he saying? I know it's a King James mouthful, so let me try to interpret it for you. What he's saying is, is this that God didn't leave it up to angels to run the world. He left it up to humanity to run the world. That was his original design and creation. I'm going to create the world, and I want humans to run it. But as we all know, humans blew it, beginning back in the garden. Couldn't, and so we've suffered ever since the fact that we can't, even though we want to, we can't control the world. And so he recognizes this in the last part of this last verse I read. Let me just read it to you again. He says, He put everything under him, the works of his hands, to roll over the works of his hands, and he put everything under him, but now, he said, but now... We see not yet all things put under him. What does that little statement mean? Right now, the world is over man, not under him. Humanity doesn't run the world. Even though they want to, they can't. With all the wisdom, they can't run the world. It's impossible. Even though we think we can, we can't. So in strong contrast to that, he begins to show us God's methodology in this great salvation he talks about in verse 9. He says, right now we don't see where humanity has rule over the world. Now, just to give you a little personal note, there's times when I've tried that. Like when I go fishing, Bob. When I go out fishing, I think, all right, God made me a ruler over the world, okay? <laughs> over the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to catch a fish. Come on, fish. Get up here. And I don't catch a fish, and I'm sorely disappointed. I thought I was ruler of the world, man. If I was ruler, remember when Jesus talked to his disciples about that? 
You know, they were out fishing all night. They they got tired of following him around because he was too hot, man. He, he had a target on his back. <laughs> Peter said, I'm going fishing. He took off, and a bunch of them went with him, and they were fishing all night long. Caught absolutely nothing. Nothing. And as they came back into the shore, they looked out, and they see a fire going there. They smell a little bit. They've got fish cooking on that fire. Hmm. They get a little closer, and they see it's Jesus. And of course, he asked them, children, have you any meat? Did you catch anything? Now, he knew they didn't catch anything. He spent the whole night keeping the fish away from their nets. He knew they didn't catch anything. But he said, listen, cast out a little ways and cast your net out. He said, oh, no, no, no. We've been fishing all night. Man, there ain't no fish out there. He said, but just because you told us to do it, we'll do it. And the catch that they brought in, they had to go get help to drag it in. He is ruler over the world, not them. See, humanity has lost the ability to control the world. That's why the world's run rampant right now. That's why it's going crazy. It's been going crazy, actually, since the garden. But does that mean God's not in control? Does that mean God doesn't have... No, 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 no. God has a plan, and the writer of Hebrews is telling us about that plan. The world is out of control, but we see Jesus. The world's going to hell in a handbasket, but we see Jesus. My life is falling apart, but we see Jesus. See, the focus needs to be on the Son who is speaking to us. We see Jesus. That is the answer. Not only to the world's problems, but to our problems as well. We see Jesus. Now, to elaborate on that in verse 9, which is what I want to share with you this morning, after that long introduction, he says, We see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now this verse is so packed with information. I want to take our time with this. And just unpack a little bit at a time because I don't want you to miss anything. We see Jesus. That's the answer to the fact that humanity has lost control of the world. That's the answer to the fact that we cannot control our lives. We see Jesus. The answer who is, as the authors already told us, the Son of God, who is the sovereign creator and sustainer of the universe, who is the brilliant brightness of God's glory, who is the express image of the invisible God. That's who we see. We see Jesus. I've said many times, you want to see what God looks like? Look at Jesus. He's the express image of who God is. We see Jesus. But notice he adds here. But we see Jesus, who was, for a short time, made a little lower than the angels, like us. Now, there's a whole volume of information here in that one statement. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. What does that mean? Jesus, the sovereign creator and sustainer of the universe. Jesus, who was the Word, who was in the beginning with God and was God, by whom the whole world was created. Jesus was made human. Paul will later refer to him in 1 Corinthians as the last Adam. 
He was made human, not only in the fact that he took on human characteristics, a body like ours, born of a woman, born under the law. He was completely human. In fact, his favorite reference to himself, what he used to describe himself more than anything else, was the Son of Man. He called himself the Son of Man. He was total, complete humanity. Just like Adam. Adam was humanity. Now, by the way, did you all realize you were an Adam in the garden? Yeah, you were. You were an Adam. You say, I wasn't an Adam. What are you talking about, man? That's thousands of years ago. That's a... 6,000 years ago, he's in the garden. What are you talking about? I wasn't, in, I wasn't even born yet. No, I know you weren't, but you were an Adam. If you ever studied genetics, you realize that you were in your mom and daddy before you were born. Did you know that? Yeah, you were. In the genetic potential of your mom and your dad. And they were in their mom and dad before they were born. And they were in their mom and dad. And then it goes all the way back to Adam. You were in Adam in the garden. Where were you in Adam? Now, I don't want to be crass by this, but you were in Adam's gonads. <laughs> yeah, you were. You were in the genetic potential of Adam, in the garden. So when Adam sinned in the garden, when he tried to live his life apart from God in the garden, when he disobeyed the one command he had in the garden and became sinful, you became sinful. You see, it wasn't all of Adam except his gonads that became sinful. All of Adam became sinful. That's why you were born selfish. Did you know that? Yeah, I know. God made you cute, so we won't kill you before you're five. But you're selfish. It's natural to think only about yourself. It's also natural to have that desire to control, run everything around you. Why? Because you are a natural descendant of Adam. In order to fix that problem, and all the problems that came about because of Adam's sin, if you go back in the garden, I found an interesting little correlation here. I'll get to it in a moment. But in order to fix that problem, God had to have another Adam. That's his methodology. And that last Adam was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before creation ever began, God's method was in place to fix the problems we got with humanity and the world. And remember, when Adam sinned in the garden... It wasn't just Adam that became sinful and under the curse. It wasn't just Eve that became sinful and under the curse. It was also the whole world, which is why Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, that, or chapter 8, that the whole creation groans and travails together in pain until now, waiting for God's solution redemption of each of you and all of humanity. Now, I know I'm talking in grandiose terms here. You try to stay with me. There's a real personal application to this. God's fix for what Adam screwed up was a second Adam who became totally human. Was it God? Yes, he was God. Was he human? Yes, he was human. He was totally human. But he was crowned with glory and honor. 
just like God in the original creation crowned Adam and Eve with glory and honor, the power and ability to rule the world, Jesus was crowned with glory and honor as he was born of the Virgin Mary into this world. The second Adam was crowned with glory and honor. Why? Why would God do this? That he, the second Adam, might taste death for every human. What's the end result of the curse? What's the end result of fallen man and humanity? It's death. That's the final result of the curse. And so God made Jesus, his son, to take upon himself the curse, death, for all humanity. Now, why did God do that? I like the way Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, rather, when he says, He, meaning God, made him who knew no sin. That was Jesus. Why didn't Jesus know any sin? Why didn't he experience any sin? Why didn't he sin? Because he was crowned with glory and honor. He made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us. Why would God do that? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, in Adam were miserable failures. But in Christ, we have the righteousness of God. That's God's solution. His solution is in his Son. What's Jesus talking to you about? He's talking about what he's done for you. You couldn't do for yourself. He's going to be talking to you about who he's made you to be. The righteousness of God. Now, the interesting little thing I, I correlated in the story in the garden in the fall, remember how he says he cursed the ground for Adam's sake? Remember that? He says, thorns and thistles will it bring forth. Remember that? But when Jesus tasted death for every man, as they nailed him to the cross to kill him, of course they couldn't kill him, he had to give up his own spirit because in him himself was life. But as he hung on that cross, you remember what he had on his head? Hmm? A crown of what? Of thorns, the curse. He became a curse for us that he might free us from that curse. You see, this is what the author of Hebrews is trying to get across to us. God's already done it. There ain't nothing for you to do except believe it. God has finished it. And as he hung on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. He made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us. And I like what Isaiah had to say about that. You remember in the story of Jesus' crucifixion when he hung on the cross, the whole world was engulfed in darkness. Why? Because the light of the world became sin for us. And Isaiah tells us that had you been there, had you been at the cross when that whole world was engulfed in darkness, as Jesus was made sin for us, and you broke out your little flashlight, if you had one, and you shined it up on the cross to see Jesus, Isaiah says you could not recognize him as a human being. Why? Because... He made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us. 
Why would God do that? To fix not only us, humanity, but to fix the world to come. See, God's solution to all the problems, His answer is in what Jesus did on the cross. But what does that mean to me personally? It means this. First of all, God's already done it. I don't need to. So I can give up justifying myself. I can give up trying to prove I'm righteous. I can give up all my little game playing to show that I'm better than you are. I can give up all that stuff. Why? Because God's already done it. I don't have to waste time on that anymore. I don't have to worry about, how do I look? Am I okay? Why? Because God's made me to be the righteousness of God in Christ. And secondly, it means to me that I'll have more, a lot more time on my hands. Did you know that? I mean, I spend so much time trying to save myself and rationalize and excuse myself and justify myself. When I don't have to do that anymore, I'm going to have a lot of time. A bunch of time on my hands. Well, what am I going to do with that time? I'm going to love you like Christ. That's what I'm going to do. See, God has freed us up to be like Christ, to be able to love one another as Jesus left us here to do. He gives us the ability and the power. Now, Jesus, when he died on the cross, you died with him, and you were buried with him. But it started in in there, remember? He rose again from the dead and is seated on the right hand of the Father in the heavenlies. And you also were quickened, made alive together with him, and raised up and seated in the heavenlies. You've already won. It's a done deal. God has taken care of it. Well, I don't see it like, it doesn't look like I've won. I look around, this world is falling apart, and, you know, I've got all kinds of threats here and there. I quit looking at that. Start looking at Jesus, God's solution. Start looking at what he's done for you, you couldn't do for yourself. Start focusing your attention on that new person he's made you to be in this new race of humanity. You see, that's why God called in the firstborn among many brethren. And the Lord willing, we'll talk about the many brethren next week in our study. So let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, as we come in your presence, I thank you and I praise you for the marvelous work that you've done on our behalf, that you, through your son Jesus, have already taken care of the problem. You've already laid out the solution for us. You've already done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. I thank you for that, Father. I thank you that all that's required on our part is to believe it. And so, Father, we ask you to help our unbelief. We ask you to help us believe what's true about what you've said to us. Help us believe your word and not our circumstances. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Appreciate you all being here. Go in peace and have a good week.